So I am Erin Ellis, financial educator with the Philadelphia Federal Credit Union. Thank you so much again for joining me tonight. Uh, a little about PFCU. Most of you who are here are members, but for the couple of people who are not, PFCU is a credit union, not a bank. And so we operate a little bit differently. Even for our members, we don't always know. We just know like, yeah, PFCU is great. I just don't really know those details. Um, and it's because credit unions are owned by our members and profits are returned to the members. And that is how we afford to have lower rates and lower fees, um, higher rates when it comes to things like, like your savings. Yeah. All right. Oh. Hang on one sec, sorry. Taking a little, a little minute to get started tonight. Um, let's get this, I have another poll for you. Very silly, but I wanna know, all right, what percentage of people have gotten a fee waived on their credit card when they didn't ask? So there's a poll. I know, silly, right? Let's see if, if everyone gets it right. Okay, so what's the answer? I'm sure we all know it's none, right? None. <laughs> nobody has nobody has gotten a fee waived if they hadn't asked. But here are some interesting statistics on this. Uh, for credit card users who have called customer service, and I'm curious if any of you are here tonight, if you have called customer service, six in 10 people got a fee waived. Pretty good. Six in 10 got a fee waive just because they called. Three in 10 were given a lower interest rate. And nine in 10 got a higher credit limit. And, you know, higher credit limit might be great for you or it might be a terrible idea depending on, on your personal habits and spending. But, um, and we can talk a little more about that. But just a little, you know, bit of trivia to say that sometimes just by asking, and this is sort of to start our whole credit conversation around having a conversation and um, communicating with the credit, uh, your, your, your debt and your lenders and how important that is. So why is credit important? You're all here because credit is important. And so credit is important for a variety of reasons. Um, credit will give us choice, opportunity, power, flexibility, and lower costs. So credit has a lot of sort of links to other things that we want in life, right? We can have choice of where we want to live, what kind of house to buy, what kind of car to drive. It gives us the opportunity to do something when we want to. It gives us the power to make those choices. Um, it offers us flexibility, again, around where we live and how we live and what we want to do and certainly significant is lower cost. So the better our credit, the lower our costs will be. All right, so here is the plan for this evening. We are going to talk through some um, best practices when it comes to credit scores. And then we're gonna look at ways to manage debt and we're gonna break it down into a few categories. You're going to look at reviewing your credit report, disputing errors on your credit report, and then really managing that debt, creating a debt log, creating a debt action plan, and some next steps. So that's the plan for this evening. I'll mention again, your resources, your handout are in your dashboard, and in there are some resources. I will be referring to them tonight, so you have access to them afterwards. So. There are certain tools and resources that I really like, and um, you already have access to those. Great, so let's talk about best practices. So this is, you know, here's a laundry list. So let's start with some best practices when it comes to credit. And we talked two weeks ago about building credit. And so then everyone sort of ends up 
at this place, right? We start with building credit. We get our first loans. We get our first credit cards. Now maybe we've got more than just one or two or three. And we want to think about what are some of the best practices. And we're going to, there are a couple that I will pinpoint tonight that we're going to spend a little more time with because they, they make a big difference. So um, what are we going to do? Are we going to pay loans and utility bills on time every time? This is a really important one because if you are paying a loan or credit card 30 days late, it will report negatively to the credit bureaus. So 30 days late will get you a negative, sort of a hit on your credit, right? Which is not good. And that negativity will last for, it will be reported for seven years that you were 30 days late on that payment. So that's 30, 60, 90. So what do you do? Certainly best practice is to pay the bill on time every time, right? Realistically, you can also make a phone call. And that was sort of the point of that first little poll talking about making that phone call to say, and I can't pay right now, what can we do? What sort of arrangement can we make? And generally the lenders wanna make an arrangement because they wanna continue to get paid, right? Their relationship is best for them when they continue to get paid. So they are generally willing to work with you and it's in that way, it also will help your credit. I know during the pandemic, there were payments that were waived for a while and then all of a sudden they weren't, but many people did not see themselves back at work. And um, you, you did have to call, there were extensions that could be made, but if you didn't ask for one, they weren't giving them out. So just a good idea, best practice, call the credit card company, call the loan um, and see about making an arrangement. Phew, that was just number one. Okay, um, next is keeping the balances on your credit card under 30% of the credit limit. And this one we have a whole slide for, so we'll go into a little more detail on that. Next best practice, pay off my credit card balance on time each, I'm sorry, pay off my credit card balance on time each month. That's what I wrote, okay. Um, so we're gonna pay it off in full, which means that when we pay it off in full, we're not paying any interest. So not only do I keep my credit limit low, sorry, my balance low. I'm also paying off that balance in full. All right, another best practice, limit applications for credit. This means we're only applying for credit that we need. So we're not getting that store card just because you get another discount. We're not getting that line of credit that you don't really want or need just because they offer it to you. Another best practice is uh, checking your credit report and making sure that any negative information is, is accurate, right? And disputing anything that's not. And we'll talk more about this best practice too. We're gonna use, if you don't have credit, how are you going to build credit using these best practices? And so that was a little bit of what we talked about last week, but then um, this time we will sort of build on that on, on how you're using this successfully. Another best practice for keeping and getting and keeping good credit is to build cash emergency savings. A great way to start this. There is another recommendation that is like, you know, three to six months living expenses, maybe more than that. Well, those are really excellent recommendations to have that much cash stashed away in an emergency fund somewhere. Um, there's also some other really helpful advice that says start with $500. So if you're working on your savings, we're starting saying, I don't have any emergency money set aside. So I'm gonna say my goal is to start with 500. Once I get there, then I bump it up to 1,000. Once I get to that 1,000 mark, now I start looking at all right, how can I save one month's expenses, right? And so we're doing it in smaller, more incremental steps. And lastly is to take all of the money management spending conversation and create a realistic spending plan so that I no longer rely on credit. 
and this is probably the hardest one here, and it has nothing to do with credit. It's much more about spending, spending habits um, and expenses, right? So that last one where we're creating a spending plan that, that I no longer need to rely on credit, this means that I'm living within my means. This means that I'm only spending the money I have. So I'm not saying I need groceries today, I get paid on Thursday, I'll go anyway, pay it off tomorrow, right? Um, because that's spending money I don't have. So let me wait till tomorrow and then I can spend it. So that's, that's that. All right, Whew, that's exhausting, right? So let's take a look at uh, the credit scores and some of these best practices. So I, I mentioned we're gonna go into detail on a few. So here's the first one that we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at, first of all, the FICO score and the Vantage score. So best practices when it comes to credit scores. So most companies, most lenders use a company called FICO to create our score. But FICO doesn't give out all of the details about how they create their, their scores because if they did, they couldn't sell their product, right? So nobody would wanna buy the pie if they gave out the recipe. But what FICO does tell us is sort of the percentage breakdown of the way your credit, report, your credit score is built. So FICO is probably the biggest credit, it is the biggest credit scoring company that lenders use, the most popular. Another company that you might see is called Vantage Score. And Vantage Score is much more often the score you get for free. So Vantage is what's affiliated with some of the, and I'm not even gonna, well, maybe I should mention, but things like Credit Karma, you will get a Vantage score, but that Vantage score is not what a lender like PSCU uses. Lenders like PSCU use FICO score. So where do they overlap? Can I use my Vantage score to sort of know what my FICO score looks like? Probably. Probably, pretty close, right? Um, certainly not exactly. The Vantage score and the FICO score are gonna be slightly different. But what I'm highlighting for you on this slide is that FICO tells us that your payment history and the amount of money you owe are the two biggest, most important factors in your credit score. Your payment history is 35% and the amount you owe is 30%. So if we're looking at that, that's 65% of our credit score. Everything else is much smaller, much less important than these two pieces. Similarly, Vantage score doesn't tell us all the details of how they get their very advanced algorithm, but they do tell us that your payment history is extremely influential in your credit score, and the percentage of the credit limit used is highly influential in your credit score. I love how, how specific these are, highly influential. Um, that's sarcasm because they're, they're not very specific and it's intentional, right? So they're, they're giving us the guidelines so we know how to help ourselves and make improvements, but they can't give out all of the details because they don't wanna give it away for free. So I mentioned before the payment history the payment history reports 30 day late payments. So if you are 30 days late, that will take a positive account on your credit report and move it into the negative and have listed a 30 day late payment. And so that does have a negative impact. And that's why I recommended just call, make an arrangement, make arrangement and call and don't let it do that 30 days if, if you can, right? And even if you're like, I can pay nothing, still call and see if you can work something out. Because the idea is you're protecting your credit from having those 30 day late payments. And it's significant that it's 30 days, not five days. Five days will cost you a late fee, but 30 days will cost you some credit. All right. And the other best practice we're gonna look at, and again, both of these scoring systems weigh these very, very heavily, is the amount you owe and the percentage of your credit limit 
used. And this is called your credit utilization ratio. And I have a star because we have more information on this. All right, so this is one that, this is a, a best practice that I think a lot of people know, but we don't always stick to. So credit utilization ratio means that we're keeping our balances on our credit cards low. Lower balances on our credit cards can improve our score. So you'll see I have two examples here. Card A, the credit limit is $1,000. That means that I can spend $1,000. The balance on this credit card is 800. So if I do the math, 800 divided by 1,000, I'm using 80% of the available credit. So that's not good according to the scoring system. Card B, on the other hand, I'm using only $100. I've spent $100 of the $1,000 limit. That ratio is 10%. So this is much better according to the credit that the scoring companies. So what do we keep in mind when seeing this? We, we wanna think about how are we paying down these credit card balances because paying down your credit card balances usually will improve your score. So paying down your credit card balances will improve your score, usually. And this is significant. I see a lot of people from time to time who will, or I used to see a lot of people when I saw people, but uh, people would tell me, you know, I have this old AT&T bill, I have this old Comcast bill, it's really getting in the way of my credit. We look at their credit report and yes, sure, they've got a two or three year old AT&T bill, but they've also maxed out their credit card. They've never missed a payment. They always pay more than the minimum, but they've, they've maxed them out or they've run up a high balance. And so, and high again is all relative. It's relative to your credit limit. So in this case, a high balance is 800. If that credit limit were 10,000, that 800 would not be high when it comes to your credit score. However, I could also say $800 is a lot for me to pay off, so it's high, right? Um, so it depends what we're thinking about when we're talking about this debt, about we're talking about how much money I have to pay and does it feel like a lot to me, or is it a matter of looking at our score? And so if we're looking at our score, we're looking at the balance and the credit limit and the, that relationship. While we're talking about credit limits, I wanna mention something that someone told me before. So we were having a one-on-one -on -one and she said to me, you know, it actually her, her card looked, it was probably like 1300 balance and 2000 limit. And she wasn't in bad shape otherwise. And I said, you know, you could ask for a credit limit increase. Or she said, you know, they offered it to me. Should I take it, right? This is the question. Should I take the credit limit increase? Right now I have $2,000 available, but they want to give me 10. Is that a good idea? So two answers to that question. One is, is it good for your credit to have a super high limit? Absolutely, right? Because then that's showing you've got $10,000 and assuming your balance is only 1,300, that will help your credit utilization ratio. However, this very smart person said to me, I don't want $10,000 limit because if I run up a $10,000 debt, I don't think I can manage it. So she knew that it wasn't best fit for her, even though, you know, on paper, it could help her score. At the end of the day, she knew that it was not going to help her achieve her goals. And none of her goals include having credit card debt. So just something to sort of keep in mind, all this stuff gets complicated because it's, you know, there's a lot of gray area. So those are the credit score best practices that I really wanted to do a little bit more detail on. And now we're gonna move on to talking about how we're managing our debt and go sort of step-by-step step through this. All right. So 
we're going to start with looking at how we're managing our debt. First, we want to know what it is. Um, for those of you who have come to my other money management webinars before, you'll know that this is a theme. I like to, let's see everything. Let's put it all in writing. Let's get it all out there. Let's get it all on the table because how can we make a plan unless we first know what's going on? So what we're gonna do here is we're starting with our credit report. You might think you have that old AT&T bill that you have to worry about, but if it's not on your report, then it's not a priority. So we're gonna start by reviewing our reports and I'm gonna give you some more information on that. Then we'll talk about how to dispute errors. So we're looking at the report. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the debt, but I'm also looking at any errors that might be there and what to do about those. Then we'll talk about how to create a debt log putting it all in writing, put it all in front of you. And I will give you a tool to help with this and then creating a debt action plan. All right, so let's get started talking about credit reports. There are three major credit bureaus and they collect all of our credit data. They're Equifax, Experian and TransUnion. And most of us at this point, you know, a lot of us have heard of these companies. They are separate from FICO. So FICO comes up with the score, but the three credit bureaus will give you the report. So they store all the information and then FICO uses that information to give you a number. Now I mentioned before, FICO generally will charge. Do I feel like you need to go out and pay for a FICO score? No, probably not. But what I do wanna encourage you to do is to check your credit report. The reports give you all the details. And these details are what's gonna to help to make the plan. I can have two people with identical credit scores. One has like almost no credit and one has a huge amount of debt. And I have no way of knowing that just by the number. So the report is really important. So there's one place to check all three reports and you can check them every week every week it used to be you could check your reports once a month i'm sorry once a year from equifax experian and transunion but since covid actually this has changed and now we can check our credit reports once a week so all three and significantly checking your own credit has no impact on your credit score so you can check your credit reports as often as you like and it will not hurt your credit score. When you apply for credit, it will lower your score a little bit. So you don't wanna go applying for credit too much and that was one of the best practices. Right? We don't wanna go out applying for credit all the time because every time we apply for credit, our score goes down a little bit. And that little bit will impact your FICO score for one year. It'll stay on the report for two years, but um, you don't want to be applying all the time and have your credit score dip just because um, you're you're applying for for credit cards. So your credit report to check your credit report every week, a good question is free. So it's free. It should say that on the slide. Um, it's free to check your report. And that's why, again, going back to, Free is good, right? We'll take the free report. Um, we'll put the score on the back burner for a minute. We're gonna use the report to figure out what we need. So let's look at what's on the report. So one website, there are other places, but this is the place to get it. And that's annualcreditreport.com. So when you're looking at your credit report, it will look overwhelming at first if you've never seen one, but slow down and take your time because you will be able to understand that, I promise, or most likely, right? Um, I look at them often and I get overwhelmed sometimes. It looks like a lot, but you just have to, you know, slow down and look at each debt individually so you can figure out what's what. So when we're looking at your credit report, we're looking at your personal information. 
checking your personal information here, a great way to make sure you're on the right track with identity theft, making sure your name, your birth date, your social security number are correct. There will be previous addresses on there, phone numbers. Uh, sometimes your spouse or employer are listed and or employer. Um, they are not, this is not an employment record. This is not saying your spouse is associated with your death, but they are included sometimes in your personal information. So for example, if I applied for a loan and said I worked at PFCU, then that's gonna be reported. That's fine. Doesn't have anything to do with anything else. It's just part of the personal information they collect. So that's the personal information, again, checking for identity theft and making sure it's accurate. Next, we're going to see the credit accounts. And these are the current accounts and historic accounts. So in this section, we see your credit limits and the balances. So this is a great place. Now it's not gonna be up to date to the day for your current credit card, but you're gonna be able to see when we make this debt log, we're gonna use this information. So we're looking at the credit limits and the balances. We're looking at the payment history. Have you had a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day late payment? You'll see the date the account was open and the date the account was closed and the original creditor. You might see, uh, actually this question came in right at the same time. So I, it's a good question. I'm, I'm just about to ask it, perfect. Um, do historic accounts ever go away? Um, they, are they there forever? A lot of the positive accounts stay for a super long time and that's okay, right? I paid it off. I paid off that car a few years ago. It's still on my report, it's fine. Just saying that I did it, right? That's no, no big deal. Um, and that might stand for a very long time. Negative accounts or missed payments are seven years. So seven years from the last date of payment. And that account will be either removed or moved to the positive. So if I had an account and six years and six months ago, I missed a payment, I was 30 days late. Well, soon it's going to pop off and be in the positive section because the last seven years I've had that positive payment. Now with any negative, the longer ago it was, the less it hurts your score. And this is important to remember. New things that happen to your credit today, tomorrow, they're gonna hurt your credit a lot more than that two-year-old AT&T bill. So those older deaths don't have as much of an impact as what you're currently doing. So that's why you know I, I focus on paying what you have if you have those those current debts that are open and maintaining what you have, making a plan for what you have. You'll also see on your credit report any collection accounts, and collection accounts will be on there seven years from the last date of payment. Technically seven years and 180 days, which is six months, right? So, um, but those negative accounts will come off your report. Now in the state of Pennsylvania, it's good to know that seven years because once it's off your credit report, it's off your credit report, right? Not a bad thing. The other number to know, the other timeline to know is four years and four years in Pennsylvania is the statute of limitation to be sued over a debt. So if I owe a credit card company, and that debt is five years old, then they cannot sue me over that debt. If I owe credit card company and that debt is two years old, then they could sue me for that debt. And then in that case, they can, they can court order me to pay, right? And make that payment happen. Um, so that, that four years is significant. You know, once you pass that, that mark, they can't legally take the money from you. Certainly you can make an arrangement to pay them if that was in your best interest, but, there are a lot of different factors, right? Um, you really wanna protect what's going on now with your credit because the older stuff does not have as big an impact as the now stuff, if that makes sense. Trying to be a little subtle, but good question. Do medical bills go on your credit report? Um, yes, but, yes, but. So um, yes, but. FICO is 
trying to go toward a system where medical bills impact your score less. It depends if people are using this FICO system yet. Generally, if people are looking, so I'm thinking an employer, if an employer is checking your credit and they see medical bills and they understand that you're a human being who might not have had insurance, generally they're going to be a little more tolerant of something like a medical bill than a giant credit card debt. So when we're talking about reports, medical bills are not as terrible as you know, all debts are not created equally. Now, will it still affect your score in some scoring systems? Yes. However, again, consumer advocates are working to, to improve on the medical bill situation. Now, if you can get your score as high as you need it to be, and, and a debt is still there, you know, that debt might or might not be a barrier to what you need to do. I'm trying to be vague, but let's see. So for example, if I owe PICO, one day I'm gonna need my lights on again, right? So I'd better pay PICO off. If I owe Capital One and I've really been struggling and six years goes by and I'm about to be seven, my credit score, I've built credit in other ways, but that debt is still there. If I can get approved for what I need to get approved for with the rate I want, then you know, maybe that paying that debt is not as high a priority as some other things I have to do, saving, keeping up to date on my credit cards, right? So I really wanna focus on making sure we're current on what we have now, making sure we're preventing debt from, from occurring in the future, not necessarily just focusing all on the past debt, if that makes sense. Um, and another question, if you're married, do you share a credit report or are you both separate? So um, you have a separate credit report from your spouse. There are different laws about who's legally responsible for debt depending on the state, but your credit reports are not merged because you are married. Now, if you have someone as a co-signer, then you would share that debt, but that could be anyone. Anyone could be a co-signer. It doesn't have to be a partner or spouse. Okay. All right, and the last section on these credit reports are the inquiries. So inquiries are anytime you're applying for credit. And this, as I mentioned already, you know, applying for credit is gonna bring your score down a little bit. On the other hand, soft checking, which means checking your own pre-approval for things. You get that credit card pre-approval in the mail, employment checks. These do not hurt your credit score. So you can go ahead and check your credit report as, as often as that once a week, and it will not impact your score. All right, I'm gonna keep plowing ahead with disputing. So if you wish to dispute something on your credit report, you see your credit report and you want to think about how to, um, some, there's an error on there and you want to fix, right? So, um, oh, another good question. Let me go back to this question. How long do inquiries stay on your credit report? Inquiries stay for two years on your credit report. However, um, FICO only considers them in your score for one year. So those are the inquiries. Okay, any other questions on the credit report before I move on? Okay. And if you have questions, just pop it right in the question box that's on the dashboard and I can see them. So dispute, so if you do see a dispute, and you know, I don't expect you to write this down, the slides are here. These are also available through the resources that I have linked to you. And the CFPB has a really great tool that again is included in your resources. It does include letters. If you wanna go the letter route, you can also dispute online and it's not very difficult to do. 
you create an account. Um, so I see this old Comcast bill, it's incorrect. I always am talking about Comcast bills. Comcast and AT&T, I figure, I feel like everybody has them. Um, you are looking at your Equifax report, you see this inconsistency, you want it fixed, so you dispute directly through Equifax. You create an account online through their website, and then it walks you through the process from there. So it's not difficult if you, once you get started. If you're not an online person, you can dispute over the phone. You can also dispute by mail. And charge-offs and collections, getting those removed. So you can certainly, any negative account that you dispute has to respond to the dispute in 30 days. So if I have a collection account that doesn't respond in 30 days to my dispute, that account will, will be removed from my credit report. Sometimes that's a good thing, right? Um, if I have an account that is mine, I want to pay it off, it's a charge off, right? It's a charge off, it's in collection. Um, you can settle these debts if you choose. Um, very often that debt still remains on your report. Usually that it says it's paid. Um, it doesn't always boost your score the way you want it to. And so that's why we're looking carefully. And before we decide what we're paying, we're gonna take this debt log. So before we decide, yeah, I'm gonna pay that old AT&T bill or not, I'm gonna make this debt log. So let's move forward to, to do this um, and talk about the debt log because I have links to all of these disputes. So we're gonna dispute errors, but then you know, if, if I do, if I am a person who's using those credit cards more than I want to, who's relying on them for things, I have to think about how am I reducing my spending um, and how am I sort of, what is my, my plan moving forward to pay the rest of my bills to, right? You need to sort of have an idea of what you can afford to pay toward the debt. So you need to know what sort, what is coming in, what is going out, and what do I need uh, what can I afford to pay? All right, so this is the debt log. And again, I have a link to this and it's in the resources that I've given you here. So you wanna gather all your bills and loan statements to help you figure out what you owe. And, and by bills, I mean not utility bills and monthly bills, but loan, credit cards, other debt bills that you have. Get a copy of that credit report because if it's not on the credit report, then we're not prioritizing it, usually. There are always exceptions. All this credit stuff, like I said, gray area. And then document them, right? And this tool will take you step-by-step step with all of them. What's the debt? What's the payment due? Are you up to date? What's the total amount left to pay? The interest percentage? and then the payoff date or goal, and leave that blank at the beginning, right? Unless it says, yeah, if you keep paying this, you're gonna get, you know, you might have it paid off if uh, it's a loan, right? My car loan five years, sure, I know exactly when that's gonna be done. So the, that's the information we're getting with, with this debt log, and the tool here will then take you to the next step. And so let me go back to this because I, I just want to talk a little bit more. When we're looking at, you know, is my payment up to date? That's an important question when it comes to our credit report. What is the total amount left to pay? That's an important question when it comes to the credit report. I would say, you know, if you have a credit limit too, that might be something you add here just for your own reference. So you can sort of keep an eye on that credit utilization ratio. But this is gonna look at these factors and help you determine what to do. If you are not up to date, you're gonna prioritize that, right? Maybe it's a super old debt, maybe then it can wait, right? So, so this is gonna help you put those pieces together. Answering these questions is, is a great first step. All right. So we're gonna talk about two different strategies and then 
take some next steps, two strategies for paying down debt. And there, there are pros and cons to both. We're gonna talk about the snowball method and the avalanche method. And there are plenty of names for these. Um, these are just two more common names. And we'll go into a little detail about these plans and take a minute to think about which one makes sense for you. So after we do that, we're gonna look at the top three debts based on the strategy, right? So we started with all of the debts, listing them out, and now we're gonna start to create this action plan around it. So we have the first part done. Let's take a look at what we like, what works with our brains. So uh, these are just two examples. So we're looking at the snowball method versus the avalanche. What does this mean? Um, the snowball method is really good um, for seeing progress. So what you do is you decide how much you can afford to pay or how much you want to pay across your debts that you're working to pay off. So let's say I have three debts that I'm working to pay off. I will pay the minimum on all of the cards and then take whatever's left in that payment. Let's say I have $200. So I pay 50, 50 and the last card, the one with the smallest debt will get $100. So when I have that lump sum, I'm distributing it, distributing whatever I'm gonna pay, here's my debt payment, $200, 50, 50 and 100. Once the smallest debt is paid off, that extra $100 is going to the next lowest card. So this is a really great, if you have many small debts, you can see progress quickly by reducing the number of debts you owe. Right? I like to see this. I can see by the end, whew, after three months, I've actually made progress, which feels great. Maybe not three months, maybe six, maybe nine, maybe 12. But um, that accomplishment can have a really big impact. So that's important to think about. However, here's, here's a con to this. If the interest rates and fees are high on the bigger debt, and you pay the smaller one first, you might pay more over the, in total over the length of the debt. And there are some really great calculators that will break down the difference between these two methods to help you decide what's gonna work. But I like the idea of thinking about, all right, do I wanna get this over with? Let me knock one out and then I can focus on the next. And then I knock that out and then I can focus on the next. So um, that's the snowball, right? We start small, we start with the smallest and work our way up. Sort of the opposite of that, or, although it, who knows, it might be similar, but is a different method is the avalanche method. So the same thing we do, we take that lump sum we decide is going towards our debt. We pay the minimum on all our cards and we put the highest payment toward the highest interest rate debt. So I put 50, 50 and that $100 goes to the APR that's 29%. Doesn't matter what the balance is compared to the others. It's all about paying off the highest interest. Once the highest interest rate debt is paid off, then that extra $100 that I, that I no longer need to pay towards that card goes to a different one. And I'm saying cards, but this can apply to whatever debt you're, you're working on. So when is this good? Well, the avalanche method, by paying off the debts that charge you the highest interest in fees, first, you save money overall. Sometimes there's a big difference between the two payment methods, and sometimes it's a small difference. There's really not a huge difference in the amount that, that you're paying. Um, however, if that first debt is large, say you really want to get rid of your student loans and so you're working on that $23,000 debt, um, you know, it, it might feel like slow progress. It might feel like slow progress. So it depends on, on what you prefer really and your personality. 
So those are the two plans. So you wanna sort of think about what's gonna work best for you. Look at the pros and the cons of those two methods. Um, and then we're starting with listing the top three deaths that we have. and what we're gonna pay on them. So this is just taking that debt log, taking what we decided with, with the method we're gonna use and taking the next step. Before we look at this in too much detail, I want to know, and, and please, if you have questions, I know. I, so somebody made a comment about student loan balance being you know, a lot, cause student loans, right? Um, when people explain this, so I learned about this in a, uh, you know, I, I took a class and we were talking about these methods for paying off debt and they included student loan payments in this. And I was like, jeepers, I would say like, yeah, do this with all my credit cards, but my student loans, like they're a whole different can of worms, follow up, you know, like, um, so, so that was just an example, but I might say for my own personal, like, all right, if my student loans are super high, I'm gonna think about a slightly, you know, they might need their own plan compared to the other stuff because I might not want to wait and, you know, just different, right? Just different. All right, so, um, so I put a poll up, let me know, do you like the snowball or the avalanche method? And I'm gonna close it in a couple seconds. All right, so a lot of people here tonight like the snowball method. I I like that because again, totally depends on you and what you wanna do and um, doing the math. I've done some different math with it. And again, there are, there are really useful calculators that you can put in all of these deaths uh, and sort of play with the numbers and see if there's a huge significant difference between these two methods in terms of what you're paying overall. But um, if you get that, sense of accomplishment that's going to help you keep going, that is the most powerful thing because that's the hardest part, right, is to keep going with it and to not accrue and not incur new credit card debt. All right. Okay. Okay, so we decided, we logged our debt. We decided on the plan for us. I know about how much I want to set aside to pay towards these debts. So this is another tool and I will, this is included in your resource guide that you can see, boom, 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 one, two, three. These are the first I'm gonna focus on in this order. And whether you're doing the snowball on the left or the avalanche on your right and starting with the highest interest rate. So again, we're going step-by-step step through this process to make it, to make a sort of overwhelming Oh, I have an example um, to make an overwhelming, confusing process as simple as possible, breaking it into steps. Um, I see someone has their hand raised, but if you have a question and can put it in the question box, that would be ideal. Um, and if not, then jot it down and I, we can unmute you at the end of the session. All right, so you you can see here, if you're able to see the slide, the two different methods I use. This is an example of the snowball method. So I've got card A, B, and C, and card A has a $500 balance, and it happens to have the highest interest rate. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hop to the bottom table there. What I'm gonna do, so I'm using $250 toward the debt every month. I have a total debt of $4,800 in this example. And so card A, I start by throwing the most on this. Now the most isn't as much as I'd like, right? It's $78, but in seven months, I'm done. That extra money starts to roll into the payment for card B. So in month eight, I'm paying $183 on that card. 19 months from then, that card is done. And you can see with card C, once I really start going hard on that, I'm doing 250 a month and that's paid off in 24 months and two years. So 
all in all, right, I handled it. Um, and, and that's sort of what's good. And I like to be able to see like, all right, seven months. Whew, okay, that's my deadline. 19 months. Okay, 24 months. If I keep to this plan, then I can get here by this time. And that feels productive to me, whether it's 24 months or, you know, six years. But, but to have that plan and have it in place is very useful and helpful. Okay, uh, a little sort of problematic thing that people sort of loop into. They tell me all the time, my credit's really good. I paid more than the minimum, but paying more than the minimum on your credit card is not enough because what you're doing is you are, you are still spending. So just because you're paying $60 onto that balance, you're still using a hundred. So that balance is still growing every month. When you pay more than the minimum and you're, you're not paying off the balance, you are paying interest every month. So whatever good deal you got last month is null and void because you've paid interest on it now. Just paying more than the minimum will, it's an endless cycle of growing debt, right? I, Spend 100, I pay 60. I spend 100, I pay 60. And this is how we end up accumulating that big amount of debt generally. It's not because we go and do something wild, but it is, it is that sort of slow and steady drip into using more and more credit. And so if you wanna see progress on your credit card debt, you must pay more than you spend. You must pay more than you spend. I say it like it's easy, right? Um, pay more than you spend until your balance reaches zero. And then we're going to work on managing it again and saying, all right, I'm going to spend 50, but pay 50 off. That way I'm not paying any interest. All right. So um, there was a question about the snowball, and I'm going to go back to that because I want to make sure that it was clear. So in this example, I have $250 monthly that I'm setting aside to split between all three debts. So card B and C are going to just get the minimum for the first seven months. Card B, I pay $80. Card C, I pay 92. And card A, I pay 78. And when that adds up, it's 250. So I'm paying the minimum on B and C, and I'm paying the rest of that 250 toward card A. Which hopefully cleared that up. Okay, so just a little, a little bit of the, um, you know, what else? Maybe this is not enough. Maybe I feel like I'm not able to manage it. I need to take more uh, extreme measures. So there are some options and I'll mention a couple and, and sort of give you, you know, if this is the option that's going to make sense for you, where to go? Because this is, this is a little beyond our conversation, but this is the place that it says here is, is a safe place to create this plan, to get this information. So a lot of people want to um, I'll just take out a new loan to pay off my credit card, right? That's easier said than done because if your credit has suffered, then you, you might not qualify for a loan, right? I'm just going to get a loan to pay off my credit cards. You, you might not qualify for that loan, right? Um, the other thing is you must be done using your credit card that caused you the debt. If you're not ready to stop using those cards to begin with, consolidating them, doing a balance transfer, taking off a loan, taking out a loan to pay off those credit cards isn't going to, to help you unless you've stopped using uh, credit, if that makes sense. So that's the consolidation loan. You know, I think it seems like an easy solution, but sometimes we just have to throw our own money at it and pay, 
pay and pay and pay. Um, another option. Now, that might be an option. People do it all the time. I have two close friends that have done a consolidation loan. You know, I got a personal loan and paid off my credit cards, but I stopped using my card, right? So that's sort of the key with that. You have to stop using cards, otherwise you just end up back in that debt. Now you've got a loan and credit card debt, and it just gets bigger and bigger. So you have to be decide you're ready. Um, another option, and we see this a lot, there are debt settlement companies, debt relief services, and you can see my warning right away. Um, these might leave you deeper in debt than where you started. So these companies that are advertising to make your debt go away, be very skeptical, very skeptical. There is something called a debt management plan. And this is when you do work with, so this is sort of what the debt settlement companies want you to think they're doing. But a debt management plan is when you work with an organization and you pay them to make arrangements to pay your debt. There's only one place that I would recommend you do it, and it is through Clarify and their partner Green Path. So most debt management plans sound really good in theory. Again, I'm going to stop paying all of my credit cards or all of my debt and only pay this one bill. But that means what's going on with my credit card? Well, I stopped paying on them. So my credit report is going to see that. So this is something that you absolutely need a professional to help you with. And um, I have a slide, the next slide is about Clarify. So we're gonna talk a little more about Clarify as a great option. Um, but debt management plans can be, unless you're with Clarify and GreenPath, they can be extremely predatory. Um, I have worked with people that paid you know, $2,000 over the course of a year and none of it went towards their debt. So you have to be super careful um, because these are sort of like, yep, they just often will sound too good to be true. So be very cautious about this, very cautious. Um, unless you're, you're going with, you know, clarifying green path, right? If you know, if it's a trusted, reliable resource. Um, so there are options around bankruptcy Chapter seven bankruptcy, and, and we're not gonna talk too much about this, but chapter seven bankruptcy, when most of your property is sold and used to pay off your debt. This remains on your credit for seven years. And then there's chapter 13 bankruptcy, and this is reorganization. So your property is not sold when you file for chapter 13. Um, you do have to complete a court mandated repayment plan. So in this case, you keep your property but you have to continue to pay on these debts. And this remains on your credit for seven years. So keep in mind too, when we're looking at bankruptcy, you know, either seven years or 10 years, negative, negative payments are only really, um, those collection accounts are staying on for seven years. So it's, what I'm saying is get get some help, get a consultation, and I'm gonna tell you where to go next. And um, so I have a le link at the bottom of the slide. I'm not gonna show it to you, but you can click on it in the slides, which you have in the handouts, but um, there's an article about debt settlement and debt relief services and should you use them? And um, yeah, the hint is probably never, right? So just keep that in mind and, and be super cautious. But who can you turn to? Because yeah, okay. I, you know, and somebody shared, like, I'm really struggling with, with the debt. Um, let me read another question here. Just give me a sec. Ooh, and someone shared, and I, I hope it's okay if I share. So somebody was part of a debt management company, even after they made the last payment, they continued to take the money out of the bank account, ultimately had to close the account and never got reimbursed for that money. Yeah, sketchy business, sketchy business. Um, so who do you turn to for help? And the questions that I haven't gotten to, I will come back to at the end. Who do you turn to for help? So Clarify is a local nonprofit. They are a partner of PFCU. And so PFCU has, we, we pay for them to do credit counseling and other counseling for our members. 
They also, as a nonprofit, work throughout the Philadelphia community and the surrounding area. Um, they are, again, I'll mention nonprofit, which means that they are not in business to make money off of you. So they're in business because their mission is to help people with their money um, and their goals. So just some examples, but they can absolutely sit with you one-on-one -on -one and give you the advice you need and talk with you about a plan that makes sense for you. Because, you know, we can have this conversation, but the most beneficial thing will be to look at all those, you know, whatever it is, all the details of your debt, all the details of your other bills and expenses and, and make a plan that makes sense for you because everybody is so different when it comes to their money and what they're doing. Okay, All right, so next steps. Next steps, these are sort of the takeaways. So um, these are those big steps that I mentioned. So this is, if you did come to the money management webinars I did, we, we talked about giving ourselves deadlines as a way to help stay on track. So this sort of includes that method, right? Where we're saying, I'm going to do this by this date. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna share the plan with someone. You don't have to share your credit report with someone, but talk, think about who are you going to share? All right, I'm going to tell my partner that I'm checking my credit report. I'm going to tell my sister that sometime next week I'm going to check my credit report. That for me is that accountability. She doesn't have to check up with me. She doesn't have to ask me about it, but I'm just reaching out and having that little back of, of accountability. So this can increase, these, these are two factors, the time that you give yourself being specific about it, and then the accountability buddy, these are two things that can help you achieve a goal. So, you know, just little strategies. Um, but the, the next step, I will review my credit report. Great, when are you gonna do that? Today is Wednesday, maybe by the by next Friday. I'm going to dispute errors on my credit report. Well, this, you know, this day is going to be different. Maybe you don't have any. Well, that's easy. Maybe you do have some. Maybe you have a lot, right? So then, you know, determine what makes sense for you from there. Created that log. When do you want to do that? And share this plan with. Don't you don't have to share your debt log with anyone. Just say, yeah, I'm talking to my sister tomorrow and I'm gonna mention it to her. So this is what I'm doing, right? You don't have to share your personal information, but you can absolutely share what you're doing. And then create that debt action plan. And that's the, how much can I afford to pay every month? Or how much do I want to pay every month towards these debt? And am I going, which method am I gonna use, right? How am I gonna pay them off? So we're gonna revisit here. And then I have a, a couple of different housekeeping things. And then I'm going to open up to additional questions that I didn't get to so far. Excuse me one second. All right, so I am going to, these are the best practices, excuse me for that, that I put up at the beginning of our session. The, so now we're gonna take these next steps and move forward. And I'm going to share a poll with you and it's gonna talk about um, what are the things that you think that you wanna do? What's the best practice you wanna focus on? So take a look and think about, I'll pay my loans and utility bills on time every time. I'll spend under 30% of my credit limit. I'll pay off my credit card balances on time each month. I'll only apply for credit that I need. Not all of these are choices, but you get the idea. I'll make sure that negative information on my credit report is accurate. I'll use credit building products to establish a credit history if I'm new to using credit. I'll build my cash savings, starting with $500, then 1,000, and then one month's expenses, et cetera. 
I'll create a realistic spending plan so I no longer rely on credit. All right, so a couple more seconds for that poll or a few, a few more seconds. Take a minute to think about it and decide what makes the most sense for you. All right, 10 more seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna close this poll and I'll share the results. Let's see how, let's see what we're doing. We're pretty well spread here, pretty well spread. Um, build up emergency savings. I love that. I love that. And and paying down under 30%. Those are great, right? And so, um, and I intentionally asked you to choose one area to focus on for this question because I think a lot of times we leave things like this and we're like, I'm gonna do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Um, but let's focus in on one and say, like, what what is something that I really want to prioritize and um yeah, and work on. So awesome. And congratulations to people um, who are ready to make some of this stuff happen, which is really exciting. Okay, so put that away. Um, these are some of the resources that I'm sharing with you so that you can find quality information. I am going to switch my screen for a second. and also plug my own webinars that I'm doing. And I'll put these in the chat. So you should be able to click on a link in the chat. So in the chat, you can click on a link to the next couple of webinars that I will be doing. And here we go. Um, should be interesting. So paying for college, this is very specific. This is for people, you know, March is the time when we get uh, letters of acceptance for college generally, and we have to let them know what we're doing. So if you either have a student who's soon to be in college, or you are soon to be in college, or you just have questions about it, then this would be a great place to learn a little more about how the FAFSA affects the financial aid, et cetera. You can read this if this applies to you. It won't apply to as many people as some of the others that I have, but um, really good information. The other one, and this is sort of much more broad, is going to apply to uh, saving and planning for a mortgage. This is not the first time home buyer webinar. This is what do I need to do before I'm ready for even that process? So what sort of, what do I need to have saved what kind of cash do I need to have if I'm gonna buy a house? What sort of credit score, what do I need to do with my credit ahead of time before I even go to get approved for a mortgage? Um, how much can I really afford to borrow and what's gonna make sense for me and my family? So please um, register for those. I, I put that in the chat and again, free, share with anyone you know. I would you know love to see as many people as possible attend. Okay. Um, lastly, before I get to questions, um, when you close out of here, there will be a survey that pops up. Please uh, take the two minutes it will take you or one minute it will take you or less to just fill out that quick survey. It's only four questions to say, um, was this worth your time? And to give me some ideas for future webinars. The feedback is really beneficial and I really, really appreciate it. So. Uh, again, it will take you, you know, one minute to do that survey and it will pop up when you exit GoToWebinar. Uh, okay, great. So I'm going to leave, uh, maybe I'll put my email up. I'm trying to decide what I'm going to share with you. Maybe I'll open the handout. Here we go.
All right. So just so you see them, my email address is on here too. So grab that PDF and save it now if you if you want it. This is the best way to get it. Anything else you want, you can email me and request it. And I apologize to uh, the person that I didn't send it to from the last time. I will definitely do it this time. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna take a sec and look through the questions and answer questions that I didn't answer as we went along. This is a great time to add additional questions. 